about this message today. Because last week, I shared a message with you called Positioned to Start Over. But unfortunately, I was not feeling well. It was not the Rona, but it was a very bad sinus infection. And so I did not have the energy or the means to really carry through what I believe God was doing. So I cut that message short. And uh, today what I want to do is I want you to pull out a Bible. If you're online, if you're in person, pull out a Bible. You're in church. That's why you came. Learn from the Bible. And we're going to go back together to 2 Kings chapter 2. And I'm going to give you a message today that I'm titling, Position to Start Over, Rewind. And we are going to go back into 2 Kings chapter 2. And I'm going to do this message justice. Because we've been a learning ser- in a learning series called The Stretch. And I was away in the month of September on sabbatical, and it was during that time that I was there that God began to really download and speak some things to me uh, about our church, about the future of the ministry, about what he wanted to do, and he led me to Isaiah 54, verse 2. It says, um, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, and this idea was that God wanted to stretch us for what he had for us. And this idea of the stretch has really overtaken how I think as a pastor, as a husband, as a leader, uh, as just a human being, how I operate, how I preach, how I interact with other people. And I'm shedding old wineskins. I don't know if you were here for that message, but I'm shedding old wineskins. I'm breaking the alabaster jar. And I've asked God to give me a renewed mindset and renewed focus. And so I believe that God's been doing that in the lives of some people. If that's you, can you say yes? God's begin to do some things in our hearts and our minds. But my issue that I was trying to get to last week is as we've uh, lived out this unusual year, um, I've been focused on the stretch, but there are some things still that I felt like ideas that I had, prayers that I prayed, goals that I had set, visions that I was believing for, these things that I had set myself up for in the past, I was living out 2020, and as God began to stretch me, he revealed or exposed that those things I was believing for, those things that I was processing, those things I was praying for, I was at the starting position of those things. I feel like I got kicked back to the beginning. Maybe I am the only one, but if that's you, could you just raise your hand so I don't feel alone in this? Okay, thank you. I feel like God was kicking me back. And so I begin to just kind of pray about this and process this because there's this unmistakable reality that these critical things in our lives, God is revealing that we are back in a position, not in relation to where we thought we were, but we're back at the starting line. And what God began to show me is that it wasn't a punishment. It wasn't that he had kicked me back purposely. It's that he had positioned me to start over. And this word from Jordan uh, Fudge back in September, as he came to minister, was that God was setting us up to start again, to try again, to go into deeper things. And God positioned us to start over. So as we rewind last week's message, position to start over, I want to go back to 2 Kings chapter 2 and just a little background. Now, for those of you who were here last week or you watched the message online, this will feel like a repeat. It is but I got brand new information for you. So just stick with me here. But 2 Kings chapter 2 is about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was the prophet. He was the man of God. Uh, He was the man that God had called to be the voice box, the voice of Israel. God gave him things to speak. He told these people, you got to turn away from your sin. And at one point, as he's traveling, God sends him to this certain land, and he says, I want you to anoint Elisha as your successor. And so he finds this guy named Elisha, Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha is working for his family, uh, and he decides he's going to burn his plows. He's not going to turn back to his old way of life, to the things that he used to do. Not that they were sinful, but just because when God called him into something new, he said, I'm going to be so dedicated, I don't want any opportunity for me to go back to who I used to be. That's a word for somebody. And so he burns his plows, and he begins to follow Elijah, and the Bible says in 1 Kings, I believe, that he was called to be the servant 
of the prophet Elijah. So he begins to serve Elijah. He got him his frappuccino that he wanted. Uh, he made sure that his shoes were clean before they started moving. He, he got the donkey ready. He got his luggage ready. He carried his Bible for him. I'm just kidding. The Bible didn't exist back then. But he, he was a servant of Elijah. <clears throat> and this is one of those roles that we don't understand in, in, in the New Testament church or in, in our idea of what servitude was. Because um, for Elisha, this was not something that it, it demeaned him. It was something, it was an honor for him to, to serve the prophet of God, to serve the man of God. And so he does this and he spends a lot of time learning from Elijah. And Elijah becomes his spiritual mentor, his spiritual father. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in 2 Kings, Elijah realizes that God is calling him to the end of his life. That's pretty dope. There was uh, someone who recently passed away. He was a, a, a pastor for many years, and uh, a friend of mine knew him better than I did. And, and he was telling me that this guy literally knew when he was going to die. And so he calls his family together and his friends together, and, and, and he begins to give these instructions of what he wants done. And he said, my time is short. It's almost done. And, and, I mean, as soon as he got off this last phone call with the last person he wanted to meet with, and just a few hours later, he passed away in his sleep. Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment, that you have that kind of relationship with God where you sense and you know that this is the moment that God is going to take you. And for Elijah, it was different, though, because his mortal body wasn't going to die. He believed that God was going to take him up to heaven. <clears throat> so he's spending this time with Elisha, and he begins to travel to these what's called schools of prophets, these prophets that were learning how to be better prophets. He begins to give the message, I believe, hey, my time is short. And finally, he finds himself at this place called the Jordan River. And every stop that Elijah made... He told Elisha, will you please stay here because I'm moving forward. I need you to stay here because I'm moving forward. And Elisha told him over and over and over again, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. I will not leave you. Elijah would say, come on, why don't you just stay here? There's some things that are going to happen. You're not going to understand them. Will you just stay here? And Elisha said, I will not leave you. So they find themselves with the Jordan River, and this is the moment. Elijah understands God is about to take me. And starting in verse 8, let's read this together. It says, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Elisha replied, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. <clears throat> You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it won't. So as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of father, fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. That's, that's a dope way to go. I'm trying to go that way. <laughs> Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan, he took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. God, we thank you for your word. I thank you that it is revealed in the hearts of people, that it's a seed planted in the heart of every hearer. I pray that it would take root and it would accomplish your purpose for which you sent it. In Jesus' name, can you say amen today? <clears throat> so Elijah is about to be taken from this earth and he asks his successor, what can I do for you? That's a sign of a very great leader. Before you leave my presence, what can I do for you? Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion. Of... And, and, and what he's asking, essentially, for those of you who, who may not understand this, he's asking for whatever it is that God did through you and is doing in you, I want twice as much of that. That's a big thing to ask. It's a big thing to ask, to say, I want double what God has done through you. And Elijah responds very clearly, this is a difficult thing that you have asked. The Hebrew word that he uses is the word kasha. Kasha is not um, difficult in the idea of it's difficult for me to give it to you, but more of it's difficult for you to receive this because what you are asking for comes with a burden that you don't understand. 
What you're asking for comes with a price. You have to learn to pay the price if you want double what I've had. Because Elijah was a man, even though he was a man of God, and I believe that he was strong, he was also human. And he went through phases in his life. Uh, In fact, one phase of Elijah's life is he literally calls down fire from heaven to prove that his God, Jehovah, is the God of Israel. And then he leads an army to slaughter these false prophets who are trying to kill him. Like, he is a man's man. He's military. He's a prophet. He can read the Bible and cuss you out at the same time. Like, this dude is is crazy. And after this, after he sees God do these mighty miracles in his life, we read in the next chapter after that he's curled up in the fetal position in a cave asking God to take his life. Like, he's not just a man of God. He's a human, too. And he, he goes through some things. He goes through some dark seasons in his life. He goes through some seasons where he's questioning, God, are you really with me? Because there's an entire nation chasing me down now after your victory. And when Elisha says, I want a double portion, Elijah says, are you willing to spend twice as much time in a cave curled in the fetal position? Are you willing to fear for your life twice as much? Are you willing to see God move in these desperate, dark, deep times where you are isolated and no one else is there? It's just you and God. Are you willing to go through these seasons? Are you willing to know that what you're asking for comes with a price? It's a difficult thing that you've asked. But if you see me go to heaven... Your prayer will be answered. If not, then no. In other words, he's kind of leaving it to God. God, if you want to take me now while Elisha's here, then I'll know that you've got that prayer answered. If not, it won't be for Elisha. And so what do we see? Elijah, or Elisha sees Elijah taken up into heaven. And as soon as, I want you to catch this, as soon as Elisha asks for a double portion, he's placed in isolation. He's by himself again. Because the role of a prophet is not about how popular you are among men. The role of a prophet is more about uh, how many people are you going to offend along the way of your ministry. Prophets are different folks. We don't talk about prophets a lot in in, uh, modern day churches, but prophets are a little different. Prophets are just straight to the point. They they don't got no emotional feeling about how you feel about this. I ain't going to argue with you. The Bible says this, you're wrong. Get your life right. Boom, done. Prophets are like dead serious about things. And so Elisha is placed in this isolation, and not only that, but Elijah is taken away from him. And as Elisha is grieving the loss of his spiritual father, it's interesting to me that he goes back to the last location of Elijah's final miracle. And I don't believe this is coincidence. I think this is human nature. Because I believe that we've been programmed to seek shelter in the last place that we've found comfort, normalcy, identity. When everything is disrupted, what do you go back to? When everything is disrupted, what do you go back to? What are the habits that you have that you kick one week until 2020 shows up the next week? And you're back at it. What are the relationships that are damning, that are destructive, that are divisive? And you say, I'm done with these. Jesus, I just want you until a disruption happens. What are the situations? What are the actions? What are the mindsets? What are the sins that we go back to when everything is disrupted? I said in the first week of this learning series, y'all are quiet today, that's interesting, that disruption disruption causes tension, and tension requires one of two things. Either someone puts their hands on you and massages you so that it can be released for a period of time, or they put their hands on you and they stretch you so that they can enable you to live beyond the pain. When you've got tension built up in your muscles, most of us, we want a massage. Why? Because a massage feels good in the moment. But what we really need is a stretch, because if you are stretched when you are feeling tension, you won't just have temporary relief, but you can live beyond the pain into what you are meant to do. That's week one. I'm just giving you a recap. Elisha heads back 
to the Jordan River, and the Bible records that before he did, he took his own garment and he tore it in two. We don't understand the inclination of what's happening here. Let me tell you the, the bottom line truth of what's happening. Elisha gets butt naked. He does. They didn't have underwear back then, y'all. Wasn't no Calvin Kleins. Wasn't no Hanes. He has a garment on. He tears it in two, and he is literally standing there isolated and in his most vulnerable state. He's grieving the loss of Elijah. He knew it was coming. It's amazing how even though when you know disruption is coming, it still causes you to grieve. I've never known anybody who said, well, I knew this was coming and I'm fine with it. No, 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 we still have a grieving process. And he rips off his cloak, he picks up Elijah's, and he takes it with him to the Jordan River. The cloak was significant because it was an outward sign of the Spirit of God and the authority of Elijah as the prophet of God. So when he finds himself back at the last location of Elijah's miracle, I want you to catch this, he had torn off his cloak and picked up Elijah's cloak. In other words, when he arrived at the last miracle of Elijah, he no longer was showing up as a servant, he was showing up as the prophet. Some of y'all don't get this. But what are you wearing in the middle of disruption? Have you chosen to keep your cloak on or have you chosen to pick up the mantle of faith? Have you chosen to keep your cloak of, uh, of, of doubt on and of fear on or have you ripped it off and picked up the mantle of faith? If Elisha had gone back to the last miracle location of Elijah dressed in his own cloak, he still would have been a servant and I don't think he would have seen God move. But it was significant for a prophet to take his cloak and put it on the, the successor because that was a sign to the successor, you're no longer my servant, but now you have my identity, you have my spirit, you are called out of servitude and into prophecy. You are now the man of God, Elisha. What many people have not understood about the year 2020 is 2020 is not an interruption into your life. 2020 is a disruption of your life. It's not an interruption. I know people do not like hearing this, and every time I say this, people get real mad. We're never going back to normal. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to. You can tell me I'm wrong. Don't tell me I'm wrong, because I don't want to have a debate. Just believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. But I can tell you as someone who has spent some time with God this year, we're never going back to normal. There will be some things that are normal again. We'll have a little bit of normalcy, but things are not going back to normal. This is not an interruption in our system. This was a disruption of the system. And I, by the way, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking about kingdom business. This was not an interruption into how God was doing things. This was a disruption. And when God allows disruption in our lives, and when God allows disruption in the kingdom, he means for it to bring about tension. Because when the disruption dissipates and we find ourselves at the end of this season, only the people of God who are willing to tear old garments in two and pick up the mantle of faith and walk in the fear of God and trust him greatly and trust him only will see that what the devil meant for evil, God turned it for his good. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it for the stretch. What the devil meant to end you, God meant to position you to start over. What the devil meant to end you, God meant to position you to start over. Where is the God of Elijah? When you got to ask that question, you need to know you are in the middle of the stretch. When you got to ask the question, where is God in all of this? That's a red flag that you're in the middle of the stretch. And the stretch is not a bad thing. The stretch is just a signal that the previous season has ended and God has positioned you to start over. 
You might be, I see some confused looks. Y'all are like, how do you know this? I know this because of basic understanding of sports. Because when I start a race, I don't start the race like this, stop midway while I'm ahead and go, oh, let me just stretch real quick. Can y'all wait for me, please? I need to stretch real quick. I don't look at my opponents and go, oh, excuse me, can you wait? I need to stretch. Just let me give me... Give me a little stretch this way. Stretch this way. Okay. Give me, yeah, yeah, I can't go all the way down my toes, so I'm going to go this way. Lord, I don't get in the middle of the race and stop. Hold on. I got, oh, I got a Charlie horse. Let me stretch this out real quick. Y'all, can you just give me a minute? We don't do that in the race. The stretch is meant pre-race. The stretch is meant to happen before you get to the starting line. The stretch is meant to, in other words, what we have been disrupted by, all of us have seen things end in our lives, and it's okay to grieve those things as long as you know that while you're being stretched in the grieving process, God is preparing and positioning you to start over for something new. How do I see this in Elisha's life? Because Elisha showed up to the final miracle of Elijah And God used the last miracle of Elijah to begin the new season of Elisha. The same miracle that God ended Elijah's ministry with is the same miracle that propelled Elisha to a brand new prophet, to a brand new purpose, to let the people of Israel know there's a new man in town, you need to listen up. He used the same miracle. He replicated it. And there's people, man, we're going to come out of this disruption, and there are people who will grieve the good old days. I've been around for 34 years of life, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard people older than me talk about the good old days. It's always the good old days. Especially if you grow up in church. Church folks like to talk about the good old days. I remember when the good old days, and we used to do this, and we used to do that, and I I miss this song, and I miss that song. It was the good old days. And what I've learned is a lot of people, they get stuck in their place of comfort of when the good old days were happening, not realizing that God reset the system. God stretched them for a new season, and while they're stuck grieving the good old days, God's doing something brand new in a brand new season, but they've yet to step into it. Because they're still wearing old cloaks, they're still a servant to the past, not a prophet of the future. Come on, I'm preaching today. They're still a servant of the past, not a prophet of the future. And if we're not careful, we can get stuck because there are folks that will come out of this era of disruption and they will be stretched. They'll be, ooh, stretched real good. They'll be crooking this way and that way, popping and, 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 you know, like Rice Krispies, snack, crackle, pop, boy. And they will get ready to move because they know that God is signaling the alarm that past seasons are over, brand new seasons are before us. And if we walk into a new season as a servant and not as the child of the most high king, we will miss what God is doing. Elisha had a choice. I can step up to the Jordan River grieving, or I can step up as a prophet ready to fight the good fight of faith, ready to experience a double portion. Remember, he asked He asked God for the most. He asked God for a double portion of the anointing of Elijah. And this is what happened to Elisha. In the timeline of Elijah, Elijah performed eight key miracles, eight miracles that that marked the land of Israel. They're recorded in 1 and 2 Kings, eight key miracles. But when Elisha took up that mantle, the last miracle of Elijah was replicated, and it became the first miracle of Elisha's ministry. And when he asked for a double portion, I believe he was stretched for a double portion. I believe he was stretched for a season of renewal. I don't know about you, but there's a season of renewal going on where God is stretching us to do the most, not just more, but the most I believe if Elijah, Elisha had asked for triple the anointing, God would have done it. Quadruple, he would have done it, but he just asked for double. And in Elisha's time frame, here's the crazy thing. While Elijah performed eight key miracles, Elisha in his lifetime only performed 15. 
I know a lot of you don't uh, understand math, but let me clarify for you. He asked for twice as much. He got 1.875 times as much. He asked for twice of the anointing. He got 1.875. Because 8 times 2 is 16. (laughs) 8 times 1.875 is 15. I just want to make sure everybody's following along. That's all. 15 is not twice as many as 8. But that's what he asked for. I can only imagine Elisha going through his life and, and, and counting the miracles as he's progressing in life. First miracle, parting the Jordan River. There's another miracle where he, uh, create, uh, um, he cleaned up a river that was salty and dry and nasty, and, and he blessed it, and, and all of a sudden it was clean, and, and the Bible says to this day it is still clean. And he tells a, a, a widow to uh, get some oil in a jar. I don't know if that sounds familiar. That was a previous miracle of Elijah's as well. And, and so he's, he's got these miracles, and he's creeping up. He's getting number 14. It's like, all right. Double portion, baby. He gets to 15. He's like, 1.875. All right. We almost there. We almost there. He's all excited. He's going to get that double portion. He's excited about what God's going to do. And then we get to 2 Kings 13, verse 20. Elisha died and was buried. Just hit. Just done. Elisha died and was buried. This great man of God that received a double anointing of Elijah, and the only way we honor him during his death is Elijah was dead and was buried. He just died. Bye. He died performing 15 miracles, 1.875 times. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring, And once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. And when the body touched Elisha's bones, when the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Fifteen miracles... He didn't see the fulfillment of the prayer that he had prayed. 1.875 times the measure of what Elijah was able to do in his ministry. But he was promised twice as much. And 15, have you ever felt like your prayers weren't answered? You got to number 15, but you couldn't get to 16. And your weight, 1.875 times your prayer was answered, but you didn't get the double portion. And you're like, what's up with that? Why am I still waiting for number 16? But no word from God will ever fail. Because if God stretched you for it, it shall be done. 1.875 times. And what God began to speak to me about was the latter glory of this church will be greater than the former. That the latter glory, the latter glory, the glory that's coming in this next season, after this disruption, during the stretch, will be greater than what we've seen before. Because what we see is incomplete, God uses for the most. What we see as the end, God sees as the beginning. What we see as the end of one season, there's a reason why people were ripped out of our lives. There's a reason why there's some things that that our minds begin to shift on. There's a reason why we went through some pain. There's a reason because we were stretched for a new season. And what you see as the end, God uses as the beginning. What they saw as dead, dry bones, God saw as a potential to 
perform his word and complete the prayer of double the anointing of Elijah. And I know a man named Jesus that died on a cross and his enemies looked at his dead body and they said, it is over, it is finished. His ministry is done, the miracles have stopped, his purpose is destroyed. And they threw him in a grave and he came up out of that grave with all power and all authority. And the Bible says that what Jesus did while he was alive, we do greater than after his death. Because I've been thrown at the feet of Jesus, but I don't get thrown on dead, dry bones. I don't serve a God who is dead. I serve a God who is alive. And that alive God began to change me and transform me and renew me and restore me so that I could do double what he did. And if the church came alive to understand Jesus was just being stretched while they thought it was the end, God said, no, it's the time for a beginning. And after he came back to life, he sent a new season called his Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost gave us power to perform miracle after miracle after miracle. The greater things happened after Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. So my question to you is, are you still living in the past? Are you grieving this disruption without understanding that in the grieving there's still a stretch happening? Are you grieving this disruption without understanding that God is still going to use you? Because it's amazing when we feel like purpose is dead, we don't want to move forward. God says, I'm going to use this for my glory. God says, I'm going to use this for double of the previous season. And what you've been sitting on last year in 2019, wondering why it hasn't come forth in 2020, because there was a disruption. God said, I have to put you back at the starting line, because if I put you in the middle of the race without stretching you first... You will fail. You will feel pain like you've never experienced. So I got to take you out of the race, put you back at the starting line, and stretch you and get you ready for a new season. And that's what I believe God's been doing in our lives this year. I believe that's what He's doing through all of the things that we are seeing. I believe that's what he's doing in his kingdom, not just in the local church, but in his kingdom. He's stretching us to turn us back to him. Can I tell you how many times this year I've been convicted of things from my past? I've been convicted of things from my present. I'll be convicted in the future. Everything this year, God's been trying to turn me back to him, turn me back to him, turn me back to him. And it's hard because I'm like, but God, I don't want to have to start brand new. Like, I've been walking this faith walk for a while. Why do I feel like I'm back at the starting line? Because I'm stretching you, Stephen. Because I've got something new, so I, have, I need to stretch you to prepare you for the new, the new season. 